the same shimmer I see on the Loxahatchee River, you know, the sunlight reflecting off the water onto our cypress trees and and ferns. I saw that same shimmer in Connecticut where I grew up, and it was like mesmerizing to me, like wow. And and so that's where it happened. We had a lake in our town, and I fell in love with water there. And we had a couple of rivers, and that's where it all happened. Our potential. It's exponential. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another podcast of Abundant Souls. Today, I have a very special guest, Rick Clegg. Rick, thank you for coming to the podcast. Jack, it's great to be here. It's wonderful to see you. Yeah, you too, man. Thank you for being here. Yeah, I know Rick. We actually, Rick's very cool. He, he's an in, investor, business person here in Jupiter. Uh, I really, really respect. And But not only that, he uh, he really cares about our land and uh, our waters. And he has an uh, outdoor center, ecotourism uh, business here, you know, right here in Jupiter. So tell us, Rick, we actually first met before I started my business. I don't know if you remember, I worked at the outdoor center down uh, on Love Street. The Jupiter Outdoor Center. Jupiter Outdoor yep. Center, man. Mm -hmm. And now since then, yeah, I was there for... I think the uh, the spring break, like taking the kids paddleboarding and all that stuff. And this summer was the 25th year of our outdoor adventure camp. Amazing. It's 25 years. Which started when I bought the property at Guanabanas in 1997. Wow. Right there. For this business. Wow. It was at Guanabanas on the water before, initially. Before Guanabanas. Got you. That's special, For man. the long timers listening... The predecessor to Guanabanas was run by Marcus Bressler, another local, and he ran and operated the Kayak Cafe out of our Outfitter store, which is where the bar is now at Guanabanas. Wow. And my real estate office was in the building where the kitchen is, and the camp was right in between all that. Amazing. And so we would paddle the Jupiter River, that oxbow, out to the inlet and have all kinds of fun. And that's where it all began 25 wow. years ago. 25 years ago. I didn't know that because I know it, it's so it started in Jupiter. Started, well, hence the name Jupiter Outdoor Center. Yes. But inspired by a wonderful company in the Smoky Mountains near Bryson City called the Nantahala Outdoor Center, cool. NOC. Cool. I've been there to those to that. Isn't that the most awesome area. place in the world? It's beautiful, man. It's the whitewater mecca for the whole East Coast of the United States. And this great guy, Payson Kennedy, started it. I was up there celebrating my 40th birthday, whitewater kayaking. And this particular day on my 40th birthday, I was hiking the Appalachian Trail with my buddy, who I had done a lot of adventuring with. And... We had maybe spent three or four days there at that point. I had fallen in love with it. And uh, we broke camp up at Chioa Bald on the Appalachian Trail. And on the 18-mile hike back, the Jupiter Outdoor Center was opened in my heart and my mind. Wow, amazing. Cool, man. And since then, you've opened a bunch of other locations, right? Well, when Those... I sold Guanabanas and sold the land to my partners at Guanabanas. Charlie of Charlie and Joe's invited us over to Love Street, where we stayed until the construction started for the Lucky Shuck and the Beacon and, and all that. And f fortunately, right around that time, Eric Bailey, who had been running canoe outfitters at Riverbend Park, retired. And so Palm Beach County put out an RFP, a request for proposal, which we responded to. And in spite of some pretty stiff competition, we won. Amazing. And that's what got us out to Riverbend, where we've been there now for just over three years. Wow. And that's a great site. It's the headwaters to the wild and scenic Loxahatchee River. Yeah, I've done that whole... <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> how special is that, guys? Like... Yeah, yeah, so you guys are there, and tell, so tell me about it, because you guys, I'm sure you have all sorts of tourists and people who come through there, taking kayaks out on bikes and all that stuff in that beautiful park, hundreds of acres. 
that park, and we still have sightseeing boats at Love Street. Okay. Where we'll put our paddle boards on and go up to the St. Lucie Inlet Preserve, which is the northern tip of Jupiter Island. There's a river that runs through the northern tip of Jupiter Island that few people know about. Very cool. And it's navigable at high tide with a paddle board. And we take out at this beach, and it's the only place that I found in South Florida where you can go to the beach and never see another person. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that is Jupiter Island, man. Dude. Yeah. We are, we are in a special spot. We really are. Let's see how long that lasts, but... Well, the only way to get there is by boat or a four-and-a-half-mile walk from the Hope Sound Nature Refuge Got you. and North. Jupiter Island. Yeah, so very few people trek that far. It's just a bunch of preserve up on the north yeah. tip. Beautiful. Yeah, it really so, is. so that's a gem for everybody. Yes. But, yeah, so at high tide. and Got to uh, do it at high tide. And that's when to paddleboard anyways, right? Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you could drop your car at uh, Cove Road in Port Salerno and paddle across, or you could do the Lux version and come with us from Love Street on our boats there you go. and have basically a mothership waiting for you when you come out mosquito cut at, <laughs> at uh, St. Lucie in the preserve and have a picnic lunch and refreshments waiting for you on board. Sounds amazing. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, that's cool. You still have a presence there because I was, I remember I was working at the at Jupiter Outdoor Center when it was over there on Love Street and it was just a beachfront. You guys yeah. had that sweet and now it's oh, developed. And It was so sweet. It was sweet. Yeah, blue water, lighthouse. It didn't get any better than that. It's true. But I River mean, Riverbend is Bend. River pretty sweet, but <laughs> a different experience. It's a freshwater cypress swamp versus, you know, with alligators versus a saltwater estuary with manatees and stingrays and turtles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, two totally different sites. Totally different sites. And the cool thing about it, and this is the drum I've been beating for quite a long time, even locals don't realize that you can put your kayak in at Riverbend and end up in the Atlantic Ocean. That's right. And transition through those two very distinct ecosystems. And In one day, in, in the same well, day, if you're quick. It, you know, it's a six to eight hour trip. Okay. You want a northwest wind at your back and you want an outgoing tide. And stop at Trapper Nelson's for lunch take on some of his energy there and then muscle it all the way to the inlet because it's <laughs> it's an epic experience but it requires some upper body strength and a certain mindset sort of like what trapper had totally yeah so tell us about trapper because that's an amazing transition <laughs> we had this jupiter wild man here and you you tell it so well tell us about trapper well, I love Trapper, um, and there's people that live in this community now that actually knew him wow. and have told me stories, and uh, Jim Snyder has written a book about Trapper Nelson, but he was Tarzan before Tarzan. You know, he showed up in the Jupiter Inlet in the uh, post-Depression era of the 30s, and he came down on Henry Flagler's railroad with his brother, and he saw the mullet jumping out of the inlet underneath the railroad tracks. And he grabbed his brother and threw his brother off the train. And then he jumped, screaming, we'll never go hungry here. <laughs> <laughs> and that began the legend wow. of Trapper Nelson. Yeah, he came down from like Jersey or something. Well, and he yeah, stayed, Jersey. He stayed in Jupiter. After yeah, that. he came from Jersey by way of Texas and then made his way to Florida. And he thought he could make a good living trapping here. And they set up camp on the inlet with a third trapper who his brother killed, shot to death. Oh. And his brother went to jail for that. And at that time, I, and this is by recollection, I think there were maybe 90 to 120 people living around the inlet at that time. And trapper thought it was getting a little crowded. <laughs> so he decided to go upriver and uh, with his bare hands and cypress trees and oaks, he created the camp that still exists there that we get to experience when we stop by and, and visit Trapper. It's still there. It's yeah. still all, there. All the structures, all the hurricanes, yeah. it didn't yeah. matter. Yeah, it wow. withstood all of that. Um, stories um, are amazing. He would, the, 
the boat captains from Palm Beach and Jupiter Island would bring their wealthy clients up to Trapper's. And uh, the story goes, he would swing by a vine across the river with his loincloth and pith helmet. Dude was six foot four, 280 pounds, like real Tarzan, before Tarzan. And he dropped these big black indigo snakes into their boats and people would be screaming. And, and that was <laughs> their first impression of Trapper Nelson as they entered what Trapper called Trapper Nelson Zoo and Gardens. And he would collect an entry fee. He would sell them air plants and trinkets, and they get to they would get to see the the animals that he captured. Story goes that he wrestled alligators, and he made a lot of money in this post depression area doing that and trapping, and he used that money to buy property, waterfront property throughout Tequesta at the county courthouse steps as people were losing their properties because they couldn't pay their property taxes. So he amassed a fortune of waterfront real estate. Wow. What is now like J.D. Jonathan Dickinson, Big right? part of Jonathan Dickinson, uh, the islands of Jupiter, uh, River Bend, wow. North Passage, and other areas like that. And the odd thing about his death in 1967 it was ruled a suicide. Uh, they found a shotgun next to his hammock in that thatched hut that's still there, the pole barn. But the guinea hens on the property had picked most of the flesh off his body by the time he was found. But they ruled it a suicide, but there were a lot of people with motives to kill trappers. So that story and that mystery lives on. Wow. His brother, for instance, got out of jail six months prior to trapper's mm -hmm. death. And it was because of Trapper's testimony, eyewitness testimony, God, that his man. brother was convicted. Uh, all the disgruntled property owners that he purchased the property at the courthouse from. And he was supposedly quite a ladies' man. Mm -hmm. And some of the boat captains would return with one less passenger on occasion. And I think there might have been some jealous husbands out there. Um, wow. So there's Interesting. lots of intriguing stories. Totally, yeah. That. <laughs> that guy's a wild man. Yeah, he, the, the wild man of the Loxahatchee. Yeah, the wild man of the Loxahatchee. Yeah. Yeah, and it's incredible. I, re I remember reading he like would he would row all the way into like where, you know, Love du Street. Du Bois Park, Love Street. Du and he, yeah. he would and he would row, he would eat dinner yeah. and crush like a whole like key lime pie yeah. or something and then yeah. go home, Yeah, row home. But not before tutoring the local kids in math and science. He was like a math tutor. He was a smart dude. I mean, Interesting. the Wall Street Journal might have been two or three days old, but he would always read it yes. and help out the students however he could. He was That's amazing. He was way out there in yeah. the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I, uh, I, uh, it must have mesmerized all the rich people from <laughs> Jupiter Island. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, eventually he gave up the rowing... Um, because he got a Jeep. He was an MP at Jonathan Dickinson, which was called Camp Murphy during World War II. And he was an MP at Camp Murphy. And somehow he acquisitioned a, a Jeep, which he kept and gave up the rowboat for the got for the Jeep. And Some technology. The entrance to the camp still exists to this day, but it's gated off and mm. you can't get in there. Yeah, it's, you go by boat you go by kayak right we go by kayak yeah very cool or for people that want to go by kayak to trappers and not go past trappers into the open water where you're exposed to the elements again our boats at love street will go up to trappers and pick up the kayakers and pick up the kayaks and motor them back to love street where they can then have lunch mm. and that's a great service because it gets windy once you get past it. Yeah, it gets you're exposed to all the elements then. Right. Yeah, but it's beautiful on that river. Man. It is. It is. But the best part of the river really is up to Trappers because yeah. that's where the transition starts to occur with the mangroves and and salt water, which you can see as a result of the dead cypress trees. The saltwater intrusion that's killing our river mm -hmm. is a result of all the bulkheads. Uh, and all Tell the development that. that's going on. Right. Tell us about that. You were saying that around the river, there's like you're actually not allowed to develop 
around the river. But what is some of the things causing that, the, the well, destruction of the river? modern-day Jupiter. Uh, there wow. used to be a big oyster bar just west of the A1A Bridge, the That's railroad right. bridge, and they blew the thing up um, to um, enhance navigation of that river. And, of course, that was one impediment from the salt water that was then gone. And then all the bulkheading, you know, less friction and the rising tides. I mean, we can see it right here in our community as a result of the rising tides. We see more and more dead cypress trees. We've already lost a couple of miles of the river from roughly North Passage up to Trapper Nelson's. And tell us, tell us about, like, you, you said you're seeing manatees further and further up, but they're looking for food. They're Is looking that... for food. When there's enough water in the river, <clears throat> the manatees will go over the dam structures and come right up to our launch at Riverbend because they can gorge on an abundance of vegetation. Mm -hmm. And it's so wonderful to watch them just nibbling away at the leaves hanging over the riverbanks. They are special. Manatees are special. They really are. Yeah, they They're don't magical want, animals. <laughs> magical. They, they don't, don't hurt wanna, anybody. They don't want to mess with. The, they want to like hang out. Almost. Yeah. 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 They yeah. do. Yeah. Very friendly. Even but even the alligators don't mess with them. Alligators give them a pass. They give them respect. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I wonder why that is. There's no. There's is. Do you think because I've heard more and more that our spraying of our lawns and all those things, the nitrogen's going into the water and and murkying up the water so that grass can't grow under there for the manatees. That's Is a big that, part of it. Yeah. That's one theory. Um, Got it. Now they're coming up with ways to actually feed the manatees. Um, the Indian River Initiative and... You, How? That's cool. They're actually bundling seagrass or some form of grass in these bundles and sinking them in the river. So the manatees can kind of pick through the the bundle and get the seagrass. So they're, you know, in in nature you learn never to feed wildlife, right. especially alligators. Right. Because we don't want them to associate humans with food. But then here they go, scientists doing it with manatees. So I kind of scratch my head. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, Rick, we have uh, limited time, so I definitely want to <laughs> get into uh, our project at Headwaters, which yeah. is amazing. So tell us, tell us about. You're actually one of our members, technically, and and we built you a vegetable garden and some fruit trees a couple years back. And uh, tell us about that project. It's so cool. So that project, uh, I purchased the land on the Loxhatchee River across from Riverbend in '97, and I always wanted to build something there. It was that was a physical manifestation of the values of the Jupiter Outdoor Center. Beautiful. Upcycling, sustainability, uh, small footprint, and shipping containers fit that bill. And about 10 years ago, I got approval through Palm Beach County to build what's there now, which is called Headwaters Eco Retreat. Uh, three 40 foot shipping containers that sleeps eight people. And 10 years ago, we started planting an edible landscape. And then you come on and create these wonderful box gardens so our guests can go out and, with a pair of scissors, uh, make a salad to have lunch. It's amazing. And they're delighted. Yeah, man. I love what, it. Tell me about some of the feedback. I love to hear that. <laughs> tell me about some of the feedback you've gotten. Like people, like, are they leaving like, oh, we love the, the salad? Yeah. The, yeah. Amazing. They, they love that. And, uh, and I think, you know, Based on that experience and the adventures they can have, whether it's biking or kayaking, um, make them want to come back. That's amazing. You have a return customer. Yes. I bet. That's yeah. Because you could walk to Riverbend right there. Walk or ride yeah. the bikes. We provide free bikes. That's right. So the guests can go over to Riverbend, launch, get a trip plan, and go on a kayaking adventure. So cool. So they love it. We love it. Uh, I lived on the property for... Uh, six months last year, and whenever I was there for lunchtime, I did the same thing. Go over with my salad bowl and do some snipping or 
pulling if it was a carrot, and uh, it was the highlight of my day. So Beautiful. Yeah. yeah, and I know I've been over there recently. I saw the rabbits are getting it, and I've had some issues with it too, so we got to get in front of that, man. Yeah, thanks for sending the information on the fence. It's mm-hmm. uh, in the works. Yeah, good stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, we, you know, it's a forever thing with farming. It's so wild. Like we, for example, like I've had this uh, farm over on Pennock Point. I don't know if you've been over there yet. I haven't. Yeah, it's cool. We have plant sales over there. It's like a showcase. Uh-huh. And we've been over there for like five years now uh, growing. And then this, because of all the warm winters, uh, this year was like really warm. And I think the iguanas kind of migrated. Oh. It's been more of an issue. So it took out all of our stuff. So <laughs> we're, we're in the process of like re- Wow. Doing more infrastructure. Yeah. So How do you keep the iguanas out? You know, that's a great question. They <laughs> they 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 climb right over chain link fences yeah. over like over those fences we use for rabbits. So for iguanas we use uh plexi, like you know the when you're uh plexiglass like yeah. on cruise ships, you know the clear. They can't climb up that. They cl- they that's can't. That's smart. Do. Or like uh siding, yeah, siding uh, like uh you know for a roof. Mm-hmm. And we just slap it right on the bed or do a fence around it. Mm-hmm. But uh it's more, you know, it's more of an investment, you know. So sure. um, it's like the deer up north or anything, you know. It's like uh-huh. trying to win the battle of nature. Yeah, we haven't seen too many iguanas out in Jupiter Farms, but yeah, I'm sure they're out there. Totally. Yeah, I saw one in a tree one time kayaking the river. Yeah, a big orange one. Uh-huh. I was like, wow, I've never seen one out here. Uh-huh. So yeah, but but not too often. Yeah, or boa or uh, constrictors. Because that wow. part of the Loxhatchee is really a remnant of the original Everglades. Wow. And the Everglades is what fed the headwaters of the Loxhatchee River. No way. But with North Lake Boulevard and PGA and all the development that's taken place, it's really impeded the water flow right. into the river, which then causes more saltwater intrusion. 100%. Mm-hmm. Because it's not flowing as it should. Right. And all the canals right. and all that probably doesn't help. No. Right. right. So interesting. So the Everglades, since it's like the top north east, east corner, corner, yeah, it would fe- it would still like kind of flow towards Jupiter. Yeah. Very cool. Loxhatchee River is one of the few rivers in North America that actually runs north. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So to, I remember you telling me one time we were bike riding that that you've uh, that people have seen like mountain lions and stuff in River Bend, and they go they're like. They go over to Jupiter Island. Every yeah, year. those What's were that? Florida panthers. Um, a Florida wildlife fish and game officer told me they had collared a panther and tracked it in the summer months coming from down near Grassy Waters or Corbett or Dupuy and ending up on Jupiter Island. And I asked him why, and he says, well, they're eating the raccoons that are digging up the turtle eggs. Wow. And, of course, that only happens in the summer months, so that's why the panther only goes over there in the summer. And, of course, I asked him, well, how does he get over to Jupiter Island? There's that bridge, Bridge Road. And he said, well, panthers are really good swimmers, so they have the option of either swimming or taking the bridge stealthfully at night. Wow. Opportunist. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stealthily at night. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be out walking then. No. <laughs> no, I haven't seen a panther. It's on my bucket list to see it live, but have seen bobcat and mm-hmm. uh, coyote mm-hmm, and me too. otters and, of course, deer are plentiful at Riverbend Park. I think people go there for that, to yeah. like the experience, you know? <laughs> yeah, and they're so docile. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Rick, I was trying to get to it uh, a little bit earlier that there's so many people, you know, experiencing this river, which is great. You know, we all want to go retreat out in nature. What do you how's like the best? Because I feel like awareness is really important and understanding how to take care of the river. Mm-hmm. How, what's the best way like we can get that across to our community and travelers and all that? Well, a couple of ways we do it at the Jupiter Outdoor Center. We have free paddling on Wednesdays for people that want to get out on the river and cool. pick up trash. And pick up trash. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And Palm Beach County and the environmental resource management groups in Palm Beach County do a really good job in offering affordable 
uh, programming. Uh, they do with uh, we give them our bikes and they do a full moon bike ride. I think one's coming up on February 3rd out of Riverbend. Um, giving people reasons through programming, like maybe everybody doesn't mm. want to paddle, but maybe somebody wants to bike. Or if somebody doesn't want to bike, maybe they'll want to hike and enjoy bird watching. So these are the types of programs that we offer in conjunction with Palm Beach County. And by getting that word out, uh, it seems to be, um, I mean, park attendance at Riverbend has quadrupled since we took it over, partially thanks to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Everybody just intuitively knows they need to get back to nature. Uh, so that has actually helped. Um, but the program that I think makes the biggest impact is our youth programs. Cool. How so? Well, teaching kids how to paddleboard and kayak and l teaching them about our environment, uh, whether it be snorkeling in the Indian River and them seeing manatees up close or seeing an alligator uh, in Riverbend, they, you know, we don't do anything other than expose the kids and teach them how to do these things. But in Always, they seem to fall in love with nature, and what we love, mm. we protect. And so if we can get them between the ages of 6 and 14, it seems to be very impactful. So wow. we're teaching a whole new generation, and we have for the last 25 years, um, what beautiful natural resources we have in Jupiter. I love that. Yeah, what you love, what you protect. Yes. That's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And children, it's so it is so intuitive. Like when you, when you're out there, it's yeah. like you just it's this is how it's supposed to be. You know why it, mess with this? Yes, any more than it's perfect, yeah. just the way it is. It's true. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't those, it doesn't need a water slide or mm, you know a slip and slide or anything other than what Mother Nature provides? Mm -hmm. Those cypress trees and the knees are really special out there, aren't right? they? Yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. I'm mesmerized every time I go on that river. And I've been paddling that river since 1976. Wow. Before you were born, Jack. Sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wait, so d that's wild. Did you grow up close to here? Where did you? I grew up in Connecticut, but I went to the University of Miami, and my family bought a winter home in Tequesta in 76. So I would come up and visit gotcha. from Miami. And the first thing I heard about was the Loxahatchee. And Immediately paddled it and fell in love with it on the spot. Wow. 76. Yeah. So cool. Tequesta was way different back then, wasn't so it? So different. It was like citrus groves or something. Yeah. Right? Well, so it was, and Jupiter as well. I mean, Indian Town Road by the Farns was still a dirt road at that point. Wow. So now lots of changes. Now it's jam-packed. It is. Yeah. Have you always been into nature? Because I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Like, I'll go backpack and just yeah. let it all, you know, turn my phone off. I love it. Yeah. Are you the same way? Like, yeah, I grew, I had the good fortune of growing up in a little farm town in Connecticut called Marlboro. And we had a world of woods behind our house. And that's what I, that's where I would go seek refuge. There was a, a little uh, brook behind my house that became like my world and there was all kind of creatures, and it was just beautiful. And that's what tuned me into nature. Even the same shimmer I see on the Loxahatchee River, you know, the sunlight reflecting off the water onto our cypress trees and, and ferns, I saw that same shimmer in Connecticut where I grew up, and it was, like, mesmerizing to me, like, wow. And... And so that's where it happened. We had a lake in our town, and I fell in love with water there, and we had a couple of rivers, and that's where it all happened, Very Fortunate, cool. fortunately. Yeah, totally, in your childhood. Yeah. Yeah, totally, yeah. So. I grew up close to here, running, running around the, on the seawall and just close yeah. to seeing manatees. And, yeah. And, yeah, it is It, it is gets special. in our DNA, <laughs> and it just has to be expressed. Mm -hmm. It has to be expressed. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, man, and I'm so, I just want to say, acknowledge you and just say I'm so grateful for you at starting that business and bringing that to our community, man. Thank you. Yeah, it's great stuff. I, I love your support and I love what you're doing. Um, Thanks, man. Empowering people 
by showing them how to grow plants and feed themselves. Heck yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And I'm honored to do it at Headwaters. And, you know, all those people who go through there, they could be touched, hopefully. And They are. They yeah. love it. Beautiful, man. So thank you for that. Yeah, man. Well, yeah, I, be- before we end this, I want to I wanna ask you, Rick, is there uh, any, like, vision you have for our community or anything you want to share with the people listening? Well, you know, in the 90s and late 80s, Palm Beach County had the mes- most aggressive um, land-buying program in the country. You know, we taxed, we passed uh, bond issues, uh, the voters did, and we purchased all this beautiful land. Now the county's trying to catch up to create connectivity between all of our beautiful natural open spaces. And I'd like to see more of that happening, uh, particularly between Riverbend Park and Jonathan Dickinson. Um, not too many people know that you can bike from Riverbend all the way up to Jonathan Dickinson. And it's a great experience. Mm. Uh, and I'd like to see more of that happening by the county. So my vision is that all of these natural resources that the taxpayers have purchased and continue to pay for uh, become more accessible to more people uh, to use, whether it be hiking, biking, equestrian activities, or paddling. Well, Rick, thank you so much for coming today. You're welcome, Jack. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, man. And yeah, hopefully we, we can do this again soon. Great. Thanks, brother. Okay.